Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of the Talking Zero podcast. Uh, today we have a special episode. Uh, we want to speak about the event of Isra wal Mi'raj, uh, which many of us know, um, and we know this is a significant event in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But today we want to um, speak about the significance of this event and how it sim- symbolised the importance of. Uh, Masjid al-Aqsa um, and also the blessed land of Al-Quds, Jerusalem. However, before we do this, let's have a quick recap of the last episode uh, in which we spoke about the year of grief, Amal Huzn. Um, and this was a very sad year for the Prophet wasallam. not only to him personally, but also to the da'wah of Islam and the mission of Islam, um, because three calamities occurred which impacted the da'wah. And the first one was the death of Abu Talib, who was the uncle and fatherly figure of our messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And obviously, he was very close to uh, the messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this caused a lot of sorrow when he passed away. However, this also impacted the da'wah and the mission of the messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because, as we know, Abu Talib uh, was the key and sole protector of the messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, and allowed him to um, give da'wah to the people of Quraysh um, unharmed um, and he had that protection uh, that that was very important because Abu Talib was a lead you know a leadership fig- he was a figure of leadership in Quraysh people gave him respect and his protection of Muhammad sallam allowed the messenger to um, you know his sahaba did get persecuted and and pros- um, punished and tortured but Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was largely kept away from this, and it allowed him to spread the message of Islam in the early stages of the Meccan period, when uh, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was interacting with the with the community, with the locals um, about Islam and his mission. However, with the passing of Abu Talib, then this uh, stifled the da'wah, it made it very difficult for the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, to speak and give da'wah to people and spread his mission because. Uh, now he didn't have this protection and the Quraysh and not just the leadership but all the enemies of Allah uh, and those who detested Islam now had free reign to attack the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a bit more harshly and it did stifle the da'wah and made it very difficult to make inroads for uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims. Um, and what compelled this sorrow as we spoke about in the last episode is that Abu Talib died as a non-Muslim. Um, and this obviously was very sad for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam His uh, one protector and his fatherly figure and uncle You know, he would have wished that he died a Muslim After all the protection and help he gave him He would have hoped that he embraced Islam before his death um, And obviously this was the father of Ali as well So this caused, you know, sadness to Ali as well um, Even after the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam You know, pleaded to them, um, Abu Talib and um tried to convince Abu Talib to embrace Islam. Uh, Abu Talib in the end refused because of his ego and pride and as we spoke about last time, you know, the whispers of shaitan uh, from amongst the men as well. Uh, the whispers of Abu Jahl and the other leaders of Quraysh who continually were, was at his bedside telling him not to abandon the religion of his forefathers for the religion of Muhammad وسلم, and he died upon kufr. Um, so obviously this was a very sad event for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and just after this event, very shortly after, a few months after, um, we had the death of his beloved wife Khadija bin Khuwailid radiyallahu anha who passed away straight after the death of Abu Talib and obviously now that he had lost that personal protection and the protection of the da'wah, the external protection, he had now lost his uh, internal protection, his moral support and his, his emotional support that Khadija, uh, his wife, his beloved wife had provided to him and we, we spoke about how she was, you know, he had a very high status in the eyes of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and indeed in the eyes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and uh, Jibreel Alayhi Wasallam and she also supported the da'wah financially, she was uh, a businesswoman and um, her wealth helped the da'wah um, uh, and, and, and the Messenger obviously was grateful for that. 
But both of these deaths now caused uh, immense sorrow for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam personally, as we spoke about, but also um, it had a very significant impact on the da'wah. And it quelled uh, a lot of what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was trying to do and it made it very difficult for him, the environment, uh, just became, became even more hostile than it already was after he lost you know, these two central figures in his life and two central figures in the da'wah of Islam in the, in the early stages. So obviously this uh, had become very difficult and and this has actually led to the the third event we're going to we spoke about uh, which which was the incident of at taif um, in this environment the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam went to seek protection from uh, the banu thaqif who lived in at taif uh, as we spoke about obviously he needed protection for the da'wah so he approached banu thaqif in taif but they rejected him in the most humiliating humiliating way uh, they stoned him, you know, made him bleed. His whole body was bleeding till his slippers were drenched in blood and sticking to his feet. SubhanAllah, you know, just imagining the scene must have been greatly, greatly, um, you know, difficult for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Zayd ibn Haritha who was with him. And, you know, they drove him out of his land, stoned him and they, you know, they they essentially told the Quraysh about the incident as well. They They gave up the secret to the Quraysh, which made it even more difficult for the Messenger to enter the land of uh, Mecca again. And following this incident, we spoke about how the Messenger وسلم, made this heartfelt dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and we went through this, but to summarize, you know, the Messenger complained only to Allah. And he he complained in a, you know, with a bit of fear that was he doing the right thing? Was he undertaking the mission that was required from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But, um, you know, and he that he was content with the situation, and he had hoped it would be better, but he was content with the situation as long as Allah Subhanahu wa Taala was pleased with was pleased with what he was doing. You know, as long as Allah had his back, had supported him, he would continue even if it you know further harm came to him. And this really um, highlighted the mentality of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that for him it wasn't personal; it wasn't about his um, personal loss or hurt or uh, discomfort it was in fact his obedience to Allah and his his wanting to make Allah pleased with him that drove him and you know this is what he was asking of Allah as long as Allah is pleased with him he is happy and we you know we took lessons from this that we should have this very same mentality that we will come go through hardships we will go through difficulties from a personal capacity but also as a capacity as an ummah and to the da'wah and the mission of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there will be uh, some peaks and troughs there's going to be some uh, calamities that we will face however we should continue to carry on with the mission of the mission of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam despite all of this as long as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is pleased with us that should be the only thing that would should make us happy and content and for us to carry on so we spoke about all of these events and you know one of the key lessons from this Amal Huzan, this year of grief, was that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his resolve increased. He became a bit more motivated to do what was required from uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. His reliance and tawakkal in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala increased as well. Um, and again, you know, this is something that we should have, the tawakkal in Allah, that we will undertake what is required from us, um, despite what may, we may face in terms of consequences, but we should strive in the cause of Allah um, as long as it pleases Allah and be motivated in this, even if we, uh, you know, there will be setbacks and calamities, but we should continue as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed us. So moving on to today's um, um, episode um, around the the uh, Isra' wal Mi'raj, um, one of the things that we recognize straight away is that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, after this year of grief and sorrow and calamity that befell the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed to the Messenger that he was pleased with him, with this gift of Isra wal Mi'raj. And why is it a gift? For many reasons we'll speak about, but also that, you know, in this um, event, in this, uh, you know, amazing event that occurred, 
um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly spoke to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa The Messenger was able to speak to Allah directly, not through Jibreel, not through um, any messenger for, that came to the earth, but the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa you know, was taken up to the heavens all the way to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which, which you know, there cannot be a, any greater gift than this. Um, as you know, there are many hadith around, you know, the fruits of Jannah and one of the greatest fruits of Jannah is to be able to see the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that many of us will not have but we pray to Allah that Allah makes us of those who will be um, given this gift uh, to, to be able to just witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so yeah this is this really showed and highlighted that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on the right path and Allah demonstrated this through this um, magnif- magnificent event um, as as the ayat of the Quran go, you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Inna ma'al usri yusra." After difficulty comes ease, and this is what occurred. You know, this was after this very difficult year that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam faced. You know, this this ease, this gift was given to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, what happened in this event? We want to speak about this today. However, we won't go into too much detail of Isra wal Miraj. Firstly, because many of us know this story a lot of us uh, listen to this you know it's been told many times in khutbas in various speeches so i don't want to repeat the things that we know already although you know i would encourage people to go back and, and read about this a bit more detail and the other reason is that um i don't want to cover it too much because our purpose isn't really to go into the fiki detail of each and every single event of the seerah but like we've already spoken about is to der- derive the key lessons from the seerah how we can relate to, to today how we can take lessons and apply it to our life today and our reality today so i don't want to go to too much detail but cover over the the fundamentals and another reason really is that this event of isra wal miraj there's no doubt that it happened it's an absolute fact that it happened it's in in the quran and we have no doubt over this as part of our aqidah however in terms of the actual events of isra wal miraj there are many inconsistencies within the um, a hadith. So, you know, there's a lot of it, it, um, you know, differences between uh, scholars, ikhtilaf between scholars um, around what exactly happened. So, like I said, I just want to cover off the fundamentals rather than go into this fiki discussion about what was the most strength, you know, strongest evidence. And you know, this is not the purpose. Um, this we can read up more into other books. And if we want to learn about it, and we should, we should learn about this a bit more detail, but we'll talk about the fundamentals and uh, the authentic evidences and and then speak about some of the lessons that uh, we can take um but uh, as i said this was mentioned in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says subhan alladhi asra bi 'abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu li nuriyahu min ayatina ayatina innahu huwa as-sami'u al-basir allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says glory to allah who did take his servant on a journey by night from the sacred mosque, Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, to the farthest mosque, Masjid al-Aqsa in Al-Quds, whose precincts we sanctified, in order that we may might show him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa some of our signs. For Allah is he who hears and sees everything. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly tells us that he directly, speci- um, um, very much, this wasn't a dream or a illusion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Masjid al-Haram in Mecca to Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem in Al-Quds. Um, and both of these, uh, you know, both of these um, mosques or surroundings are sanctified. They are um, sacred. And one of the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is that um, it was in order that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would show Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa some of his ayat, his signs, um, and give him a greater motivation and resolve. Um, as Allah says, he is the one who hears and sees everything. So, the messenger, so in terms of what actually occurred, um, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sleeping near the Kaaba, in the, you know, the semicircle area in the Kaaba. And he was taken, um, while he was in his sleep, he was awoken by Jibreel uh, um, and he washed his heart he opened his heart his chest and, and washed his heart in a, in a golden uh, container 
and you know placed it back into him and he then took muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he placed him on a uh, a beast you could call it, or travel you know a, 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 an animal as we know is called burak this is not an animal that we know of in this uh, you know that we see on earth today um, but it is a creation of allah um, and the key thing is that it was um, you know it could travel very quickly um, and the narrations speak about how it could leap from one horizon to the next in one step so obviously if you think about it that's a massive step um, and that's why it really fast you know and very speedily could get from masjid al-haram to masjid al-aqsa but in terms of description it was like a, a mule uh, but it was bigger than a donkey so um, you know Muhammad was accompanied by Jibreel uh, salam, and they rode all of the way out to um, Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem and this is what we refer to Al-Isra the, uh, the, tr- the journey all the way to um, Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Isra and you know we will speak about it in a bit more detail but this really highlighted the importance on, and significance of Al-Aqsa um, and the blessed land of Beit al maqdis the blessed land of Al-Quds, Jerusalem. Um, and one of the other things, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlighted, he, you know, Allah's linked Masjid al-Haram, who we know, you know, is sanctified land, is sacred land. He linked this to Masjid al-Aqsa, two of his sacred uh, masjids and sacred lands. So again, we will speak a bit more about the significance of Al-Aqsa that we can understand from this event of Isra wal Mi'raj. So um, from Al Aqsa, where he was taken, Muhammad was was uh, taken. Then he, you know, he um, he tied up his mule. Uh, sorry, not his mule, the burak, the the animal. Um, and Ibn Jibril alayhi salam then uh, took him upwards, and he ascended up through the seven heavens. And this is called Al Mi'raj, the ascension. So. And in this ascension, he would go through each of the heavens, uh, and he would meet and greet all the early, you know the certain earlier prophets along the way at each of the uh, heavens. Um, so initially, the first heaven, the lowest heaven, Jibril alayhi salam, asked for the gate of the heaven to be opened, and a voice responded, "Who is it?" Then Jibril alayhi salam responded, "It's Jibril." Then the voice responded, "And who is with you?" Then Jibreel alayhi salam responded, it is Muhammad. Then the voice responded, has he been sent for? And then Jibreel alayhi salam said, yes. And then this voice, this gatekeeper uh, responded, welcome. Indeed, a blessed comer has come and the door was opened. And this really highlights how this event was also expected by the inhabitants of the heavens, the angels and the gatekeepers of the, hev- uh, the doors of heaven. It was seen as a very significant event to them as well and they had been informed about it and they knew that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given permission and that's why they was at, they were asking Jibreel alayhi has he been sent for? Meaning has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted him to meet and come through the heavens? And obviously Jibreel, Jibreel alayhi salam said yes. So really building up this event and, and highlighting why this was also seen as a significant event, not just to the inhabitants of mankind and us here, but also to the inhabitants of the heavens. Um, and in the first heaven, as the door opened, um, the Prophet wasallam. and just to re- I'm really paraphrasing, I'm not going through all the detail, but he met Adam uh, salam, and Jibreel told him to greet his father Adam salam, and you know, again, they exchanged words and they greeted, um, and Adam again explaining how Muhammad salam was a blessed uh, prophet and he was you know happy to meet him then um, Jibreel Al-Sam took the prophet up towards the second heaven and the same dialogue happened with the with the gatekeeper asking whether the Messenger Sallam had been sent for Jibreel said yes and you know he was welcomed then the Prophet Sallam in the second heaven met Yahya and Isa alayhi salam um, and you know they greeted him and they again explained how Prophet Sallam was blessed um, and then the Prophet ﷺ was then taken up to the third heaven where he met Yusuf alayhi salam, the fourth heaven where he met Idris alayhi salam, the fifth heaven where he met Harun alayhi salam. So the similar dialogue took place and they greeted. And imagine for the Prophet ﷺ, you know, he's meeting all these great prophets um, and they are all um, blessing the Prophet ﷺ and they're happy to meet the Prophet ﷺ 
who you know they have been told about they have been informed about this one last final prophet um, who will lead mankind so they are very happy to meet their brother and in often cases you know with Adam and Islam and Ibrahim who, who meets in the final heaven um, you know his, their, their fa- his father as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them um, so in the sixth he- heaven he then meets Musa alayhi salam and again they greet uh, they exchange greetings and as the Prophet sallam is leaving Musa alayhi salam uh, Musa begins to cry and the Prophet sallam asks him why are you crying um, and Musa alayhi salam says that I'm crying because um, a young a young man meaning the Prophet sallam is has been given a greater ummah a greater uh, amount of people who will enter paradise than Musa alayhi salam because we know that Musa alayhi salam had a very uh, great following in the Bani Israel but obviously the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam who is the uh, the prophet for mankind whole of mankind to the day of judgment has a greater ummah and we are part of this ummah and Musa alayhi salam is crying because of this because it was this sadness that you know this healthy jealousy between him and the the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam who had a greater number of people who would enter paradise uh, as, as he had been informed by Allah then um, the Prophet ﷺ went up to the final heaven which was the seth- seventh heaven and he met Ibrahim السلام, and Jibreel told him to greet his father Ibrahim and again they exchanged um, um, greetings and other things occurred as well but um, the Prophet ﷺ carried on and you know the Ibrahim said welcome O virtuous son and righteous prophet he praised the Prophet and the Prophet ﷺ went along and Jibreel then took him to Sidratul Muntaha, the low tree of the farthest extremity. Um, and this was this uh, tree that of heaven um, that we know about and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, Sidratul Muntaha. Um, and then Jibreel alayhi salam took him to Al Bayt al Ma'mur, which is uh, equivalent to the Kaaba for the angels, the house of worship for the angels, in which we know that, uh, you know, seven. 70,000 I want to say it may be more um, so angels visit this uh, house every day um, and they never return so another seven new 70,000 come so again it showed the symbolism of this journey that you know the Messiah was seeing all these sites of heaven and you know shown al Bayt al-Ma'mur is the equivalent of uh, the Kaaba, which obviously the, the Messenger of Allah he lived near the Kaaba, so another another symbolism of of the grandeur of the Messenger of Allah and his um, his mission that he had to guide mankind. Um, and at this stage, the uh, Jibril alayhi salam left the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He wasn't allowed to go any further. Even the angels couldn't go any further. And this is where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam met Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And obviously, again, like I said, this is a an amazing sight. And in some of the narrations, um, the Prophet is asked that how you know how did he visualize Allah, and you know what did he, what did he see? And the Prophet's response was just it was it was just light, it was, it was just pure light. Um, and there's nothing more really that was said on that. But um, obviously, this was an amazing experience for the Prophet that he met Allah and he was able to converse with Allah directly, not through Jibreel alayhi salam, not through any, uh, you know, intermediary, if you want to call it, not through any of the angels he, he met and spoke to Allah directly. And this was where, uh, as we know, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the daily prayers on the Muslims. And as we know, uh, this command started off as 50 daily prayers. In one day, the Muslims were commanded to pray to Allah 50 times and you know Muhammad Sallallahu accepted this and he went back down the heavens um, to you know inform obviously inform the ummah of this command but as he went down the heavens he went back to past Musa alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam told him that your people your ummah will not be able to fulfill this command they won't be able to do 50 prayers in a day you know based on Musa's experience of Banu Israel he said that the people will not be able to follow this go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him to reduce this number and the Prophet went back to Allah and this was reduced by 10 to 40 
and then again came back down. He, you know, Muhammad accepted this, came back down again. He went past Musa and in similar conversation. Musa salam, then said, "You know, the Prophet, that your people will not be able to fulfill this command either. Go back to Allah and reduce it further." And this conversation continually happened. You know, it went from forty to thirty to twenty uh, to ten, and then even at ten, Musa salam, said, "This is too much." Go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him to reduce it further. And the Prophet ﷺ went back and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reduced the command, uh, the, the, uh, the daily prayers to five a day. Which we have today obviously. And as he went back past Musa, guess what? Musa ﷺ still said, your people will not be able to fulfill this command. Go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him to reduce this number even further. And Muhammad Sallallahu said, I'm too shy to go back to Allah. I have gone back several times, obviously. Um, I'm too shy to go back to Allah for, to ask for a further reduction. And he, you know, he didn't go back. And, and that's where we have the five daily prayers. So again, it just shows that Musa Sallallahu had this foresight of his experience of his people. That he knew that, you know, even this simple obligation of praying five times a day would become uh, very difficult for the Ummah. And we know there are examples of many Muslims not praying five times a day. Um, so, you know, Musa Salam was right that there are many from the Ummah who are Muslim who don't pray five times a day. And we pray that we are amongst the ones who do pray and pray correctly and our prayer is accepted uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so, you know, Muhammad Salam obviously descended back down to earth um, and he was in back to Jerusalem in Al-Quds and he said he led the other prophets in prayer in the sight of Al-Aqsa. The surroundings of Al-Aqsa is where the Prophet ﷺ prayed and he led the other prophets in Salah. So he was the Imam, he was the leader of the prophets in Salah. And this is another symbolism here that the Prophet ﷺ carries a, a certain status amongst the prophets and he is the lead prophet because he is uh, the you know the the final prophet and he is a prophet that is sent was sent to the whole of mankind and this was not the case for any of the other prophets they were they were sent for their people um, and from you know after one and after another another prophet came for another people and it was only Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as we know who had this status of being a prophet for the whole of mankind from when he was sent as a messenger all the way to the day of judgment. Um, as Abu Huraira narrates that Allah Messenger said that I have been preferred over other prophets with six things, one of which is that I am sent to all of creation. So there's a few lessons that we can take from this, uh, obviously this event that occurred. Just speaking about some of these final uh, things we spoke about the, is the importance of Salah. The only command to be ordered to the Muslims that we have to fulfill today as an obligation, the only one that was ordered uh, in the heavens by Allah directly, the only obligation was the Salah. You know, we should really think about this. The only command, the only obligation that was ordered in the heavens directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Messenger وسلم, was the Salah, the five daily prayers. Every other obligation was ordered on earth and was ordered through Jibreel alayhi salam. The message came through Jibreel alayhi salam. Obviously, the revelation came through Jibreel. So, this that's not to belittle any of the other obligations. Obviously, they are obligations that continue to be important and something we must fulfill. But I'm just making the point that the salah is the only obligation to be ordered directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens. Just really reflect on that. It really highlights the importance of salah as an obligation. And why when we pray, and this is a lesson for me and everyone really, that when we pray, when we are fulfilling our obligation, obviously it can be quite difficult sometimes we can be lazy we can have a tired and long hard day obviously sometimes in the winter like we have now uh, multiple salah uh, in a very short period of time and we can get lazy and obviously we should pray uh, i pray that everyone does pray their five prayers but we also may need to make sure that we have that concentration and that khushu when we pray 
um, so that we uh, you know we, we we can you know get the reward and also ensure that Allah our salah is accepted and this you know just thinking about the fact that this was ordered in the heavens and ordered directly by Allah places a massive significance and inshallah can make us motivated whenever we pray that we know that this is the obligation that Allah commanded in the heavens really highlighting its uh, importance and significance the other thing to know is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala although the salah was reduced from 50 to 5 the reward we get for fulfilling the five daily prayers is the same as 50 subhanallah this is the blessing and mercy of Allah even though he reduced the burden upon us the difficulty and imagine praying 50 times a day subhanallah it's difficult to even imagine that we would have time to do anything else that would be constant salah but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reduced it to five however the reward of the five daily salah is the same as the reward of praying 50 times so subhanallah again showing the mercy of Allah for one but also the ni'mah of salah the blessing of salah and one of the other things just to note is that many scholars speak about how uh, you know there's a difference of opinion here but there are very famous scholars who explain that the one who leaves salah has become non-muslim there's a debate about this but the fact that they are discussing it really again highlights the importance of salah as we all know but you know we shouldn't even leave salah um purposely because you know this is something that some of the scholars say takes you out of the fold of islam it distinguishes us between the kuffar the disbelievers so this is one of the key lessons from Isra al Miraj. We should reflect on upon it, um, and it's something that you know should, inshallah, motivate us to always be praying on time uh, and and with the quality uh, and khushu um, in in our salah when we, when we do fulfil that. The other lesson to take from this event is the finality of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As I said, he led the other prophets in salah in Al Quds. You know, this symbolizes the leadership of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam over the other prophets and his leadership of mankind. Because every prophet came with the, the same message for certain people. But the Messenger sallallahu alayhi came to confirm that message, but for the whole of mankind. And, you know, this is something that we should recognize that we are, luckily, we're, you know, not luckily, but we are blessed to be part of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This is a blessing. Subhanallah, you know, we can forget and take it for granted that we are part of this ummah that, uh, you know, Allah has blessed us with. You know, if the likes of Musa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam are following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam in salah, what does that say of those so-called followers of these great prophets today? Those who say they follow Musa, the Jews, those who say they follow Isa alayhi salam, the the Christians, what does that say of them? If they, if they prophets who they claim to be their prophets are following the Prophet, then what does that say of that? Why do they reject Muhammad? Is this not a rejection of their own prophets? Right? So, this is something that we know, obviously, we know no religion is accepted to Allah except Islam. And this is very important because as we know we know this as Muslims obviously that's the reason we're Muslim but even when it comes to our conversations um, with other non-Muslims or even fellow Muslims there is this um, idea of Western idea of pluralism religious pluralism that um, is often part of the Western framework that we speak about and we you know, over Christmas you've seen that many khutbas out there have tried to normalize this fact that you know everyone has their own religion, we are very similar, and the the Abrahamic religions and all of this message is being heavily pushed. Right? Even with the normalization agreements that we find, uh, one of the key messages that are pushed is the Abrahamic religions. And in fact, this concept is very new. There was, you know, we we speak about the in the Quran. Obviously, it spoke. We speak about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala speaks about the, um, the, the uh, the people of the book, Ahlul Kitab, 
which is which is fine we know what that is however the the concept of concept of abrahamic religions is a very very alien concept it's a new concept that has been pushed to kind of give this message that you know we're all following the same god we just have different prophets and it's kind of acceptable however as muslims we should recognize that it is it is not acceptable in the in the least um the only religion accepted to allah is islam and every other religion is a corruption um, and it is not the following of isa alayhi salam or musa alayhi salam if they were here today as the hadith of the messenger goes about musa he says to Omar when Omar is, was found reading some um, scriptures of the Torah, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to Omar, "What did he say? He said, if Musa alayhi salam was here today, he would have no choice but to follow me.' Meaning, the Quran has come and it's abrogated all of that. This is the finality of the message. This is the message that we must follow, and this idea of pluralism we must reject. There is no pluralism in Islam. If it's only Islam." Yes, people have their religion that they can follow it, but we do not we do not put them on equal footing with Islam. Islam is the only truth. Everything else is falsehood. And if they want to worship in their personal spaces, that's for them. But we should never equalize Islam with any other religion. This is dangerous and this is something that has been heavily pushed and we should be aware of it and we must also reject it. The other thing uh, to note and a lesson to note is that, you know, the finality of the Prophet ﷺ in that there will be no Prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him as Khatim and Nabi, the seal of the Prophets. Uh, recently there's been quite a lot of social media talk about the Ahmadis and the Qadianis. I think um, it came after, the, you know, there was a something went viral around when you search uh, current Khilafah or Caliphate or Khalif of Islam. I think uh, in Wikipedia, it says that it's the leader of the Qadianis, something like this. And this has caused a lot of debate on social media, you may have seen, around, you know, what the Ahmadis and the Qadianis say and their beliefs. And I don't really want to speak about, I don't think it's worthy of giving any airtime, but we should know that anyone who rejects the finality of the Prophet wasallam, that he was the last Prophet and there will be no one after him, um, you know, they fall out of the folds of Islam. They are not Muslim. And this is plain and clear. There's no debate to be had about it. They are not Muslim. And even if they call themselves Muslims, they uh, they are not Muslim because they reject this very fundamental part of the Islamic Aqeedah, which is uh, accepting that the Messenger وسلم, is the final and last prophet of, uh, of, of, of mankind. So... The really one thing I did want to touch on with a bit more time and uh, focus is the significance of Al Aqsa that we learn from this event of Al Isra, Al Mi'raj, um, and not just Al Aqsa but the significance of the blessed land of Al Quds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like I said, directly links Masjid Al Haram in Mecca with Masjid Al Aqsa, right. Not only um, is, is it mentioned in the ayat, like I, sp- like I said, he, he explains that these two lands are sanctified and it is from Mecca, from the Kaaba, the Prophet ﷺ is taken all the way to Al-Quds, Al-Aqsa, the Masjid Al-Aqsa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making this link between the two that they are both sacred and they're both sanctified. Um, and then Jibreel alayhi salam. So, so just before that, you know, what it really does, it shows that our love for the Kaaba, our love for Mecca and the blessed status of Mecca, you know, if anything happened to this land, we would be outraged. Muslims all over the world will be outraged because, you know, this is a, carries a massive status towards, uh, a significance towards, rightly so, you know. Um, if anything happened to the Kaaba, we would be. And I think even, you know, there's little small events that happen throughout the years around um, if any part of it was damaged or destroyed or um, I think there was an explosion near the Kaaba at one point you know things like this even this causes concern to the Muslims and, and it's because we carry it carries such significance to us but here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has linked Al-Aqsa to this as well you know the fact that Al-Aqsa is also sanctified Al-Aqsa also carries this great status and it is a uh, you know sacred land and you know I'm not 
belittling it, most Muslims do carry the same love for Al-Aqsa and they recognize that it's being violated even though it's sacred land and it's uh, you know sanctified land it's being violate, violated on a daily basis but we should not lose this sight of this you know this land is being violated and there are many conspiracies occurring against this land for the last century there has been and it continues to this day and every conspiracy seems to getting seems to be getting worse and we'll speak about uh, some of this shortly the other thing that really highlighted the significance of Al-Aqsa is that it was from the location of Al-Aqsa in Al-Quds that Jibreel alayhi salam took uh, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi salam um, and you know from the, the ascension occurred, the Mi'raj occurred and he took the Prophet sallallahu alayhi all the way up through the heavens. It was from this location. So why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose this location? Because it is blessed. It is, uh, you know, the 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 best of places that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could take the Messenger of Allah to and then you know the the ascension to occur. And then the third thing that really signifies it is that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he led the prophets in a salah in this land, in this place, in this location of Masjid al Aqsa and you know Omar when he uh, conquered this land, he that's where he built the masjid. Um, because it was obviously in the hands of the Crusaders, the Romans. So not the Crusaders, the, the Romans. It was in the hands of the Romans, the Byzantines, and that's why, uh, you know, the Omar, when he recognized that this is where the prayer took place, he made this, the, the, the surroundings, Al-Aqsa. It, it became much of Al-Aqsa. So all of these signify the importance and the significance of the blessed uh, Masjid Al-Aqsa and its status, and Al-Quds. So for the Muslims, this really highlights that, you know, along with many other evidences of its importance, but this event in itself, if it was just this event, really highlights the importance and significance of Masjid Al-Aqsa and its surroundings. Uh, Zayd ibn Thabit, uh, radiallahu anhu, he reports that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, how blessed is Al-Sham, which is the whole surroundings of Al-Aqsa, and you know, people may translate this to Syria, but it's all of that land, it's Bilad al-Sham. Um, not the modern day Syria we're speaking about today. So he says, How blessed is Al Sham? The companions, radiallahu anhum, they asked, Why is that? And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, replied, I see the angels of Allah spreading their wings over Al Sham. And then Ibn Abbas, uh, he added, And the prophet, prophets lived therein. There's not a single inch in Al Quds, Jerusalem, where a prophet has not prayed or an angel has not stood. Subhanallah. So this is in uh, Tirmidhi Ahmed, um, and you know really signifies the importance and the status of this land, of not just Al Quds and Al Aqsa, but the whole of Al Sham. And as we know, another evidence of the importance and significance of Al Aqsa is that it was the first Qibla of the Muslims, right? So throughout the Meccan period, um, even though you know. Think about this. The Muslims, the initial Muslims, they were living in Mecca. The blessed land of Mecca. They were living there. Yet, the Qibla initially was towards the direction of Al-Aqsa. You know, really highlighting its significance. Why, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose this? Because it was a significant and blessed land. And this was the way that they would pray. Until it was changed in, in Medina. Um, Al-Aqsa is the second house of Allah to be built on earth after the Kaaba. It's been uh, destroyed and rebuilt many times, but it was the second house to be built, uh, you know, the, house, the second house of Allah to be built. Again, highlighting its significance and again linking it to the Kaaba. Um, Al-Aqsa is referred directly or indirectly 70 times in the Quran. And it's the only masjid that is mentioned in by name in the Holy Quran apart from the Kaaba. So again, another clear evidence of its significance. Um, this land, as we, as uh, the hadith we spoke about says, you know, this is the land where the angels descended with Allah's message to the various prophets that came to this land. So again, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose this land? Because it carried that status, that importance. And hence why many other religions obviously give this land importance too. You know, obviously the Jews give this land importance and, and the Christians do as well because it carries that historic status to all the other religions as well. 
um, and the Sahaba, they understood afterwards, you know, after this event of Masjid uh, al Isra al Mi'raj, all the evidences of Hadith and the Quran, they understood the importance of Al Aqsa and Al Quds. And what they also understood, what understood why it needed to be under the authority and protection of Islam. You know, we know that. Al-Aqsa was actually not captured in the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It was actually captured and liberated and conquered under the reign and the leadership of Amir al Amir al Mu'minin Umar ibn al Khattab radiyallahu anhu. You know, it was under his reign that Al-Quds and Al-Aqsa was liberated from the Byzantines, the the Romans, under his Khilafah. And it was after the Battle of Yarmouk, uh, the army of the Muslims decisively defeated the Romans. And they, and they rule in Syria, the Byzantines in Syria. And although uh, you know uh, numerous armies, Muslim armies, under the command of Khalid bin Walid and Amr ibn al As, they began to surround the city of Al Quds. And the then um, the leader of or the king, you could call it the the leader of Jerusalem, who was um, one of the um, Byzantines. His name was Sir Sophronius. He actually refused to surrender the land to anyone except. The leader of the Muslims, who was Omar, obviously, and it was it was not really a regular occurrence for Omar to be going going out to each of the lands to accept its surrender. It, it wasn't required, but because Omar re- recognized the importance and recognized the significance of this land, he he accepted and he came and he he accepted the surrender himself and he accepted the keys of Jerusalem himself. Um, and you know, there's lots to it. We can speak about it in later sessions about the you know the Omari Treaty, which uh, was a very uh, an amazing treaty that really highlighted the justice of the Muslims uh, when it came to Jerusalem. That uh, you know, the Crusaders had nothing similar to it when they uh, you know conquered the land and they massacred all the Muslims. Um, and you know, various even today, obviously, the the Israelis, the Zionists, continue to carry on the the uh, path of the Crusaders, uh, you could argue. So Al-Aqsa then remained under the control of the Muslims for mo- almost 460 years. More than actually, more than 460 years from 638 CE on from Omar all the way to 1099 when it was captured by the Crusaders. And that was when obviously, like I said, all the inhabit- inhabitants were massacred. And you know, we have the records of the Crusaders boasting about how the blood uh, from killing all the Muslims was so much that the blood rose to knee height of their horses. And they, and they showed often about this, they boasted about this. Uh, the leader of the time, Godfrey, he, he has poems about this. Really, you know, proud of what they did, their massacre uh, and the bloodshed that they caused. And, you know, this obviously the, this land, this blessed land remained under the crusader control for many years, almost a hundred years. But in uh, 1187, as we know, this blessed land of Al-Quds was recaptured by none other than Salahuddin al-Ayubi following the Battle of Hattin. But as we know, Salahuddin didn't massacre all the inhabitants. He, his importance, again, was around ensuring the authority of Islam was in Jerusalem, ensuring that Jerusalem was under the protection of the Muslims. And we know that many of the inhabitants that were not, and obviously non-Muslim, they they were happy with the fact that Salahuddin uh, conquered this land because the Crusaders were an oppressive force. And, you know, he allowed uh, many of them to carry on practicing their religion in their private spaces. Um, and, you know, this land, although it was captured by the Crusaders and was in the control of the Crusaders for almost 90 years, you know, the Muslims never lost hope. And they never lost their understanding of the significance of Al-Aqsa. They never accepted and normalized the existing existence of the occupying crusaders. Imagine that they never, you know, they didn't accept this. They didn't normalize relations with the crusaders. So what about today? What are we doing today? What are the leaders are doing today where they're accepting the occupation? They're embracing the occupation, you know, unashamedly. Think of the likes of Salahuddin and Omar, if they knew what the leaders of today were doing. And like we know, even near the end of Islamic rule, we know that the Zionists, they attempted to purchase the land of 
uh, this blessed land, the bl- land of Al-Aqsa and Jerusalem from the Muslims. And the, you know, the founder of Zionism, the- Theodor Herzl, he came to the Khalif Abdul Hamid II and he offered him 100 million gold coins to purchase that land. He offered him money upon money, you know, a huge amount to buy the land from him. And what was Abdul Hamid II here? What was his response? He said, as we know, many of the, you know, we've heard this many times, but just to repeat what he said, and he said, advise Dr. Herzl, Herzl not to take any further steps in this project. You know, stop what you're doing. I cannot give away a handful of soil of this land of Palestine, for it is not mine to give. It belongs to the Muslim Ummah, who have fought for the sake of this land and watered it with their blood, irrigated it with their blood. Subhanallah. The Jews may keep their millions. If the Islamic Khilafah is one day destroyed, then they would be able to take this land, this blessed land, without a price. While I am alive, however, I would rather push a sword into my body than see the land of Palestine is taken away from the Islamic Ummah. This will never happen. I will not start by cutting our bodies while we are alive. Subhanallah. So this is, you know, Abdul Hamid, there's lots of lessons we can take from this, but it shows that non-compromising stance when it comes to the blessed land of Al-Quds, Palestine, the whole, you know, whole of that land. He understood that the Muslims have fought sent for centuries, historically, all the way from the time of Umar, have fought for this land with their blood. And we cannot give it away so cheaply. You know, there's no price that can be put on this land. And he even also recognized in this that, however, if that Islamic authority is destroyed, the Islamic Khilafah is destroyed, then you can take it for free because this is what is protecting that land. And there's so much lesson we can take from this that, you know, only when we have that protection, that system that will be that shield for the Muslims in Palestine, will we have true security. And, you know, the likes of Abdul Hamid II, the likes of Salahuddin al Ayyubi, and Omar and the many Sahaba afterwards and the great leaders afterwards who recognize the importance of Al-Aqsa, we should recognize that this have that same significance and importance when it comes to Al-Aqsa. And we should also recognize what they're doing today when they're you know, openly normalizing ties with uh, the occupying forces, what it really means in the grand scheme of things. What does that really mean? It's not a mere land. It's not just any old Islamic land. This is the cream of the crop and this is the land that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has symbolized in the Quran and he has explained to us its blessed status this event of Isra wal Mi'raj really signifies and highlights the significance of this land and we know that after the Khilafah was dismantled by the British in the 1900s we lost Palestine and Al-Quds and the 1917 Balfour Declaration and the British Mandate of Palestine was the start of the occupation of Palestine. And this blessed land slowly, slowly started being taken away from us. You know, and it was given to the Zionist occupying criminal force of Israel. And the reason I mention all of this is that it's just we have to recognize and understand the history of Palestine is not merely a Palestinian issue. It's not an issue that we should view as just the Palestinians. This is an Islamic issue. It's an um, it's an issue that concerns the entire Ummah. And, you know, it's under occupation. And the Muslims are being persecuted and killed on a daily basis there. You know, we saw recently um, there was a image of and video of an old man, an old uncle, an old, you know, man, Muslim man, fighting the Zionists with catapults. SubhanAllah. You know, it, there's other images of the past where we've seen a small child throwing stones at the Israeli tanks. And this really shows that the Ummah has not given up on Palestine. The Palestinians have not given up on Palestine. They will, without their military hardware, without their AK-47s or their rifles or whatever, they will go and defend that land. And it's not the Ummah that has given up on Palestine. It is the leaders who are in authority today. Um, the sellout leaders really who have given up this land the likes of uae the likes of saudi arabia all of these regimes who are not representative of the muslims they have given given this land for a for a cheap price 
right? So, you know, the great Sahaba understood the significance of this land. And every single Islamic rule following, you know, the Rashidun, whether it be the Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Ayyubids, the Fatimids even, they all recognized the importance of this land and, and the importance of it being under Islamic rule. You know, and this is something that we should carry today, even though we don't have our authority, we should not lose sight of what Al Aqsa really means to us. You know, multiple plans have been hatched against this land. Multiple. All the way starting from the Crusades of ten ninety nine when it was captured and taken from the Muslims and it was held for ninety years. You know, that was the, the, the greatest uh you know, plan, and they succeeded. And obviously it was only Salahuddin al-Ayyubi who liberated this land. But following on more modern times, you know, like I spoke about, the Balfour Declaration of 1917, that's where it really started, where slowly this land was being taken over. Because, you know, the destruction of the Khilafah in 1924 was about to occur. And, you know, this we had lost our authority and our shield, so it was easy for General Al Alimbi who was the British uh, commander there, the general, he he walked into the land. No one really stopped him. He walked into that land and he took over control and it became under the British mandate of Palestine, as we know. Um, but then since then, there's been various other plans uh, hatched against this land. Um, and each and every plan you will see, and there's a there's an image that has always been shared where showing it from, you know, what was that historic Palestine where the Muslims had ho the whole land slowly slowly by them sending jews and christian uh, jews uh, into the land and the zionists c taking control like a, a cancer you can see how year on, you know ev after every plan that is hatched the muslims start to lose more and more of that land and that land is handed over to the zionists so the 1917 Balf balfour declaration was that first one that we started to lose that land then the un plan of 1947 that was the next plan again where we lost almost 50% of that land. Then we had the 1967 borders following this fake war that took place between Israel and the Arab countries of Egypt, Jordan, all these surrounding lands. They apparently lost the war against Israel, supposedly, right? And, you know, further land was taken and given to the Zionists. And that's why it's very. We need to be very careful of what is referred to. Sometimes, many leaders and many people that would seem seemingly say they support the Palestinians, they will always re refer to the 1967 borders. And the 1967 borders is is a, is a treachery. We we cannot accept those borders because it would be surrendering a lot of Palestinian lands. Even though the Israelis won't want to give this either, but as Muslims, we don't want any of their plans. We want the entire land of Palestine to be liberated, you know, before all of these plans were hatched. Um, and then obviously there was the Oslo Accords of 1993, the Camp David Accords of 2000, all, you know, plans hatched against the Ummah, uh, trying to defeat the Ummah and trying for the Ummah to surrender this land. But the Muslims stayed strong. And today we have the most recent plan, which is the US deal of the century which is the most treacherous and well treacherous I can't really call it treacherous because it's hatched by the enemies of Islam of, of Allah and of the enemies of Islam but this plan this latest plan the deal of the century really is the worst for the Muslims because it relinquishes the whole of Palestine and that voice of the ummah we've really been trying to highlight this to the Muslims that we really need to be aware of this very dark and evil plan that the US have created to relinquish the whole of Palestine um, and just to summarize what what does that contain you know there's lots of more information that we have we've done a whole podcast on this we've we've shared lots of inf information on this and you know it's available on our social media but the key things that are part of this plan is that Jerusalem this blessed land of Al-Quds that we're speaking about becomes the undivided capital of Israel so we lose all of the blessed land of Jerusalem Israel then is allowed to annex all the settlements and the outposts that they have in West Bank and Jerusalem. So all of those illegal settlements they can annex. Then the other part of that plan is that only peaceful Muslims, quote-unquote peaceful, can visit Al-Aqsa and perform Salah for a limited time. So, you know, this again is a massive restriction. 
that if you're only considered peaceful, you can come and, you know, you can be a tourist. You know, thank you, Israel. You can, you know, subhanAllah, like, what is this that, this is an absolute, this is no compromise. This is total uh, humiliation to the Muslims. And we cannot accept it and we need to expose it. The other thing they have is that any resistant resistance group, anyone, any individual that is causing resistance, they must lay down their weapons. And the the significant meaning behind that is that, you know, we should accept the occupation. There should be no more resistance against the occupation. You know, even though we don't have that much of a military force or, you know, there's, there's Muslims there fighting for Palestine, even they must lay down their weapons. And if they don't, they will be dealt with, basically. And then one of the key ones that we uh, many know about, that $50 billion will be paid by Gulf states, meaning Saudi, UAE, these countries, to push other states and the Palestinians to accept normalization with Israel. And that is what we see right today, where there's been all of these normalization agreements occurring, starting with UAE, moving to uh, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, the recent one, and many more will come, including Saudi. Saudi will eventually um, give up, and they will they will uh, you know normalize ties with Israel. Um, and you know the, this is one of the things that will really pave the way for the deal of the century to be implemented. Um, you know, the Saudi are just really fearing the backlash that will be caused when they sign up. But the the significant fact is that normalization itself is becoming normalized it's becoming a non-issue now every you know when uae did it it was a massive story every muslim was outraged like you know alhamdulillah they should be outraged they were outraged and then when it came to bahrain yes outrage then sudan it's gone a bit less you know it's outraged but you know it's becoming a bit more normal then when morocco even less so as and when countries start Normalizing it, beco- it the normalization itself becomes normalized, and uh, the shock waves are not as great as the previous. So Saudi are just waiting for the right opportune moment for them to normalize, and they can just say, "Look, every other nation's done it, so why can't we?" And nothing will happen. So again, this is something we should be aware of, and we should not lose the heat. We should continually expose the leaders who are doing this, and expose uh, the fact that they are, you know, they're playing with. A matter of aqidah here. This is part of our aqidah. We cannot give it up. And this is the reason why I spoke about all of these historic, uh, you know, realities that took place when it came to the significance of um, of Al-Aqsa. Starting with Israel al mihraj you know, it really signi- signified it. Then, you know, the history of Omar and Salahuddin. It's, it's not a simple issue. It's something that is dear to all Muslims and we cannot forget our, you know, our brothers and sisters in Palestine who are being persecuted, nor can we reject or forget the blessed status of this land. And then the final thing, you know, part of the deal of the century, to just to finish the summary, is that Palestine will only remain as a state in name only. You know, they may be given, given a statehood, but in no in name, because they will have no army, they will have no resistant movements, like we said, they have no control of the borders or airspace. This is this will be controlled by Israel. And only 15% of historic Palestine will be left for the Muslims. You know, and even this area <laughs> that they have will be, you know, under watch of the Israelis and control of the Israelis. And most likely they will carry on placing their illegal settlements so that this 15% then can quickly dwindle down to absolutely nothing. SubhanAllah. This is the reality of what we are seeing here in Al-Aqsa today. And subhanAllah, imagine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed this immense status on Al-Aqsa when he took the Prophet wasallam from Mecca, the blessed Masjid al-Haram, all the way to the blessed Masjid al-Aqsa. And it was there that the Prophet wasallam ascended to the heavens. It was there that we were. he met all of these prophets in the seven heavens. It was there where he um, was shown the house of the house of Allah for the angels. It was there where he had the conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was above this land. It was there where we were commanded the great obligation of praying five times a day. It was this land that this is, land is being given away now for free. So you tell me, brothers and sisters, 
should we not be crying for this land should we not be shouting for the you know for the liberation of this land should we not be calling out these leaders who have sold this land for a cheap 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 price to who to the zionist occupiers who have been violating our sisters who have been uh, killing civilian brothers and sisters who have been uh, bombarding the uh, land and the the area of al-aqsa and even into into the mosques with the filthy shoes firing at people subhanallah like i don't know how much more to say it but this is a clear aggression that is occurring that we must continue to shout for and call people tell people about this uh, and expose the plans of, the, of of what is occurring in this land and i've said it once and i said it again and i'll say it again is that the deal of the century is the greatest uh, conspiracy that will occur against palestine we need to be aware of it and you know something that voice of the ummah will have, have shared lots on we will continue to speak about um, but you, you know this is something that all muslims should read about and, and make themselves aware of so to really uh, bring this uh, to an end the only final thing i want to speak about before concluding is the the events that occurred after the Prophet when he came back to the uh, you know he was taken back to mecca and, and the kaaba and he was brought back and jibril brought him back through um you know on the buraki came back um the next morning uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi he uh, came back to mecca and he told the people about what had occurred and subhanallah he had no embarrassment like he wasn't even though it's such a you know unbelievable event it was literally unbelievable people wouldn't believe him he didn't have any embarrassment because he knew what had hurt, had occurred was huck it wasn't a lie they, you know many people may accuse the, the prophet of being a fake prophet na'udhu billah but you know these events where he's speaking freely about things that would be could easily be used against him he didn't because he was on a huck obviously and there was no need to be embarrassed or hide away from the truth he came out openly and he he gathered uh, you know there's a gathering with all the Quraysh leaders including abu jahl and he said to him this has happened i went to uh, Jerusalem in the night I went all the way up to the heavens saw the uh, prophets and spoke to Allah and this occurred and you know they started to mock him they said how can this be this is you know he, he's become m- uh, mad and all of this mockery that was occurring against the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but he didn't care and you know he actually proved his journey in two ways very clear evidence um, he described Jerusalem when it was asked what it looked like he described it in a way that no other person who hadn't traveled to this land would be able to describe and it was, ver- it was verified people knew that people who had been to jerusalem said he speaks the truth this is how it looks this is how it is and also whilst he was on his journey to jerusalem when he was on the burak he encountered three of the cav- caravans of Quraysh, and he described in every detail what he saw you know, and the Quraysh, when he when he described this, obviously the Quraysh didn't know. They themselves said, "Okay, this is a clear proof. If he sa- he's he's right in what he says, after we verify it, then this would be a clear clear proof that he is telling the truth." And Subhanallah, this is the typical nature of the enemies and the hypocrites and the uh, those who have a seal in the, on their hearts and their eyes, is that they when they verified it, it turned out to be hundred percent true. The caravans were directly uh, described exactly how they were. The camels were described and what you know what had occurred and things like this. All of it was described in detail. And when it was verified, what did the Quraysh say? He must be a magician. They still, even though they said this was a proof, this would pr- uh, you know you can be used as an evidence. They themselves went against this, as as we know they would, and they called him a magician. And Subhanallah, even some of the weak Muslims they left islam and returned to kufr uh, because they were unable to believe this incredible journey this incredible story of the prophet and they succumbed under the pressure uh, and the mockery that the Quraysh had said you know they succumbed and they left islam Um, and some people even went to abu Bakr, and they told him you know your companion muhammad he claimed that he went to jerusalem he made salad there and he returned to mecca in one night and they told him that the Prophet ﷺ was at the Kaaba telling people. 
and when you know when they told him they they were sure that Abu Bakr would question it and not believe it and he would you know potentially even leave Islam because how can this be true but Abu Bakr subhanallah came out with an amazing response really highlighting the status uh, of Abu Bakr really as Siddiq where he got the name actually so he his response was by Allah if he actually said this if Muhammad Sallam said this then he has told the truth there's really nothing to be amazed about he said for he has told me information that comes to him from Allah from the sky to the earth in an instant during the night or the day and I believe him in it and this is even more strange than what you're telling me so what he's saying is that you're telling me that this is an amazing story that he went to Jerusalem in the night it's unbelievable but but actually I Abu Bakr I believe Muhammad Sallallahu gains revelation in an instant from Allah and to, to Abu Bakr this is even more amazing so he believes him in this so what is this this is nothing this is nothing even there's nothing greater than the fact that revelation comes to him uh, day and night directly from Allah and subhanallah it was due to this statement this due to this unwavering stance of Abu Bakr that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave him the title of as siddiq the truthful because he knew the truth for what it was straight away no hesitant hesitancy or anything like that and the other lesson to take from this is the importance of verification and the iman so whenever we hear a story we should verify that they aren't lies so abu, abu bakr he didn't say muhammad sallam is telling the truth he said if he said this if muhammad sallam said this then he is speaking the truth because you know they could make lies about him so he didn't want to just accept it whatever he heard as hearsay but he was saying that if he said this if i can verify that he said this then he is telling the truth and this is quite important in today's reality because there's a lot of deception that occurs there's a lot of fake news as we we call it today um that is spreading around uh, against islam against muslims and other stories that you know it's very important that we verify um before we take anything on because um only then can we arrive at the truth and then the other thing to um make clear is that today we um have you know many people mock islam to make us waver in our belief right so many people tell us about all of these uh, lies that they make up and deception to to make us waver um and this is what they were trying to do with abu bakr they didn't make anything up but they were trying their plans to waver in his belief however if we have arrived at the truth firmly right then any argument can be destroyed with the truth of islam and that's why it's important and we've done it in previous episodes where we arrive at the truth firmly rationally we arrive at the fact that there is one god the fact that he is yeah he's one and he is the one who sent the quran the the quran is the speech of allah that we can verify again and we can go through that process to understand why it was a miracle and i won't go through the detail of this but when we have that firm foundation that abu bakr obviously had and we should try to have obviously he's a great sahaba we can't you know maybe ne- never get to that status but if we can try to have that same mentality and say come to the foundation of islam in the same way then we will have a very similar stance where we won't waver we won't have the doubts that come into our head and it's important especially as in this reality of uh, secularism and atheism that is being pushed today that our youth also come to the conclusion of, of islam in in this way so subhanallah a lot has been discussed again and i want to really conclude uh, about some of the lessons we spoke about and i won't repeat the points but um you know al isra wal miraj was a very significant event that occurred that there's much more to say about but the lessons that we can summarize from this is that you know salah as i said was the only obligation to be commanded in the heavens you know it's very easy that we become lazy um in salah and not really give it the concentration of focus that it should have but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded this directly to the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the heavens and he has blessed it with the status of carrying 50 rewards instead of 5 subhanallah we should use this as a motivation to pray on time and with khushu uh, when we're praying and not not missing and delaying our salah and not giving it that service i think that's one of the key lessons to take from isra wal miraj the other thing 
that um, I haven't spoken about really, but during the journey of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and the Isra wal Mi'raj, he was shown various punishments for some of the societal ills and sins that the people were doing. And this included um, backbiting, uh, eating wealth of orphans, consuming riba uh, interest, uh, fornicators and those who didn't pay zakat, amongst other things. And uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was shown the punishments. You know, very disgusting punishments. For example, the backbiters shown to be eating the flesh of their brothers. The well, the person who was eating the wealth of orphans showing that he's eating hot coal that is burning him. Those that are consuming riba showing that they have snakes in their bellies that can be seen. And lots of very, you know, um, horrific, you could call it, punishments that were taking place really signifying the, the seriousness of these sins. And... You know, again, it's very important that we do read some of these narrations to give us that understanding of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for those who undertake these, you know, major sins. And one of the things that uh, really highlights again is that Islam isn't merely salah. You know, I've spoken about the salah and the importance of salah. And it, absolutely, we should not belittle this. But also, this journey shown showed us that Islam also came for society it came for the transactions it came for um, the way we interact with uh, other you know how the gender inter interactions that we shouldn't be uh, cheating or fornicating or whatever it may be um, zina all of this is shown and when it comes to our wealth we need to be making sure that we it's it's pure and it, we do fulfill our obligation of zakat all of this really highlights is that Islam is salah, absolutely, but also all the other transactions, all the other obligations that the Messenger of Islam was shown. And uh, the other thing that we spoke about is the leadership of the Prophet Wasallam over all the other Prophets. And the fact that we are part of that Ummah. We are part of that Ummah of the Prophet Wasallam. He was the, the final of Prophet of, of, uh, of, Is of Islam, of mankind. And this, you know, we're in that stage. So we have to take that serious and really understand what is our role. What is going to be our role as being part of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Are we just going to take it for granted or are we going to recognise what it really means to be a Muslim? The other thing as we've spoken about a lot is the blessed status of Al-Quds. The journey itself, the Isra wal Mi'raj really highlighted this importance of Al-Quds. So, so we should recognise it's not a mere piece of land. We can't just sell our deen for it like the leaders have done. You know, it's part of our aqidah and we should never accept the occupation of this land. We should actually be seeking its removal. Not what the leaders have done today where they're normalizing the existence of the occupation. Where they're happy for the deal of the century which will relinquish Palestine to be implemented. We cannot do this. As the Ummah of Muhammad it would be incorrect for us to do this. And subhanAllah, many are standing up. We must continue to raise our voice and expose this. And also recognize the real solution for Palestine and the real solution for the occupied lands. It isn't merely lobbying governments. And, you know, we have examples in the past. We have Salahuddin al Ayyubi. We have Abdul Hamid who told us how, you know, the land will be taken and how it will be regained. And we have, you know, obviously Omar, his example of when he initially took this land and, and took it under the control and author authority of Islam and the Muslims. So it's really important that we understand this history of Al-Quds, taking lessons from the great Sahaba and the Muslim leaders of the past, comparing them to the leaders of today, showing, understanding and acknowledge what it means to be a leader in Islam and how we should liberate it, obviously, like I said. And we shouldn't accept any of the plans of the UN and the enemies of Allah and those who are, have tried to hatch plans continuously against this blessed land. We need to reject all of that and recognize that it's only the Islamic solution that will liberate Palestine. So, subhanAllah, lots have been spoken about. I pray that you have benefited from this uh, episode. Like I always say, please share with others and um, let me know if you have any questions in, on our social media, inshaAllah. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms 
in the description below.